to Dr. Zakir Naik, thank you very much for a very, very inspiring speech, very energetic, and so many excellent points that we can learn today from our distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, on Muslim professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will move on to the next session, more stimulating, inshallah, more engaging, the Q&A session. And on that, we divide the audience into eight points. So on my left-hand side, we start with a first point, second point, then at the back, the third point, and fourth point. Our sisters, uh, up there, the fifth point, then the sixth point here, a seventh point up there, and the eighth point there. Is that clear? So I may give the rotation uh, according to the numbers. Okay? Uh, by the way, not necessarily to start with one, two, three, four. I may call one, then uh, seven, and then uh, second, then eight, and so on, okay? <clears throat> and to derive more benefit for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines or rules to be observed during the questions and answer session. In the interest of getting a proper and clear answer from the speaker, kindly state your name and profession before putting forth your question. Uh, questions asked should be on the topic only. Questions not relevant to the topic will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. A short and sweet place. This is a question and answer time and not a lecture or a debate time. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go at the back of the row again and await your second chance for questioning. Uh, eight marks have been provided for the questions from the audience. And as I mentioned, that uh, we have eight points all together uh, in this hall. And our uh, committees, uh, the assistant uh, will help you as well uh, to ensure that you can uh, ask the questions uh, very nicely. We will allow one question on each of the mics in a clockwise rotation and written questions on slips of paper which are available from our volunteers in the sites would be given secondary preference after the open questions on the mics are answered by the speaker. In the interest of not having any time wasted on irrelevant issues and to ensure a more educative and an interesting question and answer session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions will be final. Would that, would that be okay for you, uh, brothers and sisters? Alhamdulillah. So now we will start with a question number one from point one. Uh, please. Uh, go to the mic, please. Jazakallah. I would like to make a request that if we have any non-Muslim in the audience, we would uh, prefer giving them the first option of asking the question. Our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, they are the guest of honors for this program today. If there are any non-Muslim in the audience who'd like to ask a question, they would be given the first preference. So surely they can break the queue. If any non-Muslim like to ask a question, they can come on the microphone and they can raise their hand they would be given the first preference. 
Are there any non-Muslim brothers and sisters in the audience who would like to ask a question? Feel free, you can ask any question. Even if it's out of the topic, no problem. For the non-Muslims, if they can ask any question. You don't have to agree with me, you can disagree with me also. Yes, brother. Your name and your profession. Uh, sebelum saya mengucap, uh, uh, saya nak kata dua perkataan dulu, uh, iaitu uh, uh, saya kena terima kasih dulu lah kepada Allah Ta'ala uh, pasal saya, saya datang ke sini. Uh, saya nak tanya dalam bahasa Malaysia lah, pasal saya, saya bahasa Inggeris saya kurang faham. Uh, Allah Ta'ala cipta manusia Uh, uh, sorry, brother. Dari... Can you state your name and profession, uh, please? Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, nama saya Tachina Murti Analaki Subramaniam. Uh, brother, English... if you know English, it's better. Because uh, I don't understand Malay. If I know. You, I know you... English. English cannot. I am Malay. Okay, so we'll ask the coordinator to yeah. translate in English, inshallah. Okay. No problem. Okay. You can ask the question in Malay. Okay. And the coordinator will translate okay. it, inshallah. Uh, saya nak uh, ter banyak saya dah baca banyak saya dengar dalam bab uh, agama Islam iaitu Rasulullah saya tahu lah uh, dia uh, saya mula-mula saya dengar dalam dalam ni Islam ya mula-mula Allah antak manusia ke, ke dunia ini uh, melalui Adam dan Hawa jadi uh, kita dari start dari Adam dan Hawa jadi mula-mula uh, mula-mula uh, dari Hadam dulu, dari Hadam yang masa uh, semasa uh, semasa tu uh, dia dia buat kesilapan satu, iaitu uh, Allah beritahu jangan makan buah itu, tapi dia bila makan buah itu, pada itu Allah Allah, kata, uh, Allah bagi dia turun ke ke dunia ini uh, dengan uh, lepas itu dia seorang saja. Dia seorang saja. Lepas itu uh, dia sedih. Lepas, lepas itu Allah hantar seorang uh, apa? Dia ambil dari dari demi ini uh, demi rasul demi apa? Apa yang apa? Uh, tulang rasul. Dia, uh, dia bagi satu wanita ke dia. Lepas itu dari start tu uh, dari satu manusia sudah sudah bermula. Dari manusia sudah bermula dari mula uh, da, sudah mula dari mula dari start dari itu. Manusia dia berpindah pindah pindah lama ke lama lama ke lama dia pindah pindah dia sudah pi dia pi negeri China ada di China dia pi dari pi India ada di India jadi kita semua mai datang dari Allah dari Tuhan satu kenapa kita asing asingkan you lain saya lain itu lain kenapa cakap macam tu tak boleh itu itu okay. kesalahan itu kesalahan manusia okay. uh, uh, itu saya so dengar saya dengar Rasulullah Rasulullah saya dengar dalam radio India Uh, okay, so, so, so itu itu soalannya ke? Brother, brother, the speech time is over. This okay. is a question answer time. Okay, okay. The coordinator rightly said that the question should be in two or three sentences. More okay. than that is the speech. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, brother, itukah soalannya? Okay, okay, itu, itu soalan. Uh, okay, satu lagi saya nak beritahu. Uh, jadi Rasulullah ada beritahu. Dia, dia, uh, dia kata suruh belajar sampai negeri China. Uh, itu satu. Lepas itu, uh, itu kafir itu, kafir itu apa dia? Saya nak tanya, kafir itu, uh, uh, saya tahu, dia bagi, uh, Allah beritahu, itu kafir itu, dia, uh, orang yang tak, uh, orang yang, uh, apa, orang yang tak ingat kepada Tuhan, itu, itu orang, ya, orang kata kafir. Tapi, you, saya uh, tengok orang-orang Islam, lain pada, lain pada bangsa lain, dia orang kata kafir, kafir. Saya pun heran lah, kenapa cakap macam tu? Ah, kita semua datang okay. dari Allah, dari Tuhan. Uh, Kenapa okay, jadi... saya, uh, saya faham soalan yang uh, dikemukakan. Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Terima kasih untuk ucapkan. Yeah. I'm trying to summarize what he want to ask. Okay. Uh, first, it is about uh, the creation of. Brother, uh, first I would request you that please don't allow such long questions. You are setting the rules of the rules of question and session. You are breaking it yourself. If you have set the rule, you said two or three sentences. If he's speaking more, you should have made it short because it's not possible to repeat everything. And then I will not give a very appropriate answer. So see to it that if someone gives a long question answer, long question, more than, more than three sentences, cut it off, please. Okay. So that we allow others to ask the question. Yes, go ahead. Please. So the, the question relates to the creation of uh, the first men, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, that uh, come from 
uh, one creation uh, that supposedly all will be the same. Uh, but why? It has been diverse and uh, varied uh, from here and there. There is Malay, Chinese, Indians, and so on. Okay, and then, um, it's about the, the notion of uh, kafir. That how? One question, the second question. Okay. <laughs> you said in your rules that ask one question at a time, okay. second question go behind and you're not stopping him. Okay. You're giving a lecture on professionalism following rules and regulation. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. First time allowed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are a professional, uh, not a Muslim professional. Yes. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Dr. Zakir, uh, on uh, the notion on uh, kafir and the misconception and even sometimes misunderstanding among the Muslims uh, themselves that uh, sometimes they may easily call somebody kafir just because of different races. The brothers asked two questions. The first question is that we have been created from one pair of male and female, the Adam peace be upon him, and Eve may Allah be pleased with her. How we have different races, Malay, Chinese, Indian, how we have different color. This was answered in my lecture, and I quoted a verse of the Quran of Surah Hujurat, chapter number 14 and verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuwa nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shawmba wa qaba ila litaraf wa inna karamun min dalla yatkaakum inna Allah alimun khabir. Which says, O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored is the person who has taqwa. Allah says in the Quran, we have created you from a single pair, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. And have divided you into nations and tribes, Malay, Chinese, Indian, African, American, so that you may recognize each other, okay, you are Malay, okay, you are from Malaysia. You are Chinese, you are from China. You are Indian, you are from India. You are white, you are from Western country. This is the Quran thing. So that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise either. Oh, I'm a Malay, I'm superior. You know, I'm a Chinese, I'm superior. Our beloved prophet said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No white is superior to a black. Neither a black is superior to a white. So here we come to know Allah divided so that you can come to know your origin. And as we know in medical science, as you keep on dividing, the differences keep on coming due to the DNA. Allah further says in Surah Rum chapter number 30 that he has made different languages and different colors so that you may know each other. So this is the variety of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Different types of people. But a prophet said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Not a non-Arab superior to an Arab. No black, don't say you're Arab, therefore you're superior. No white is superior to a black, nor a black over a white. Color does not make you superior. Race does not make you superior. Wealth does not make you superior, except taqwa, that is God conscious. More a person is God conscious, more the person is righteous, he's superior, irrespective whether he's an Indian or a Chinese or a Malay. The more righteous the person is, the more superior he is. This is mentioned in the Quran, I also mentioned in the talk. Now coming to the second part of the question, that why do people call non-Muslim as kafir? And why do they look down upon them? What is the misconception? Kafir is the Arabic word coming from the root word kufr, means to hide something or to reject something. Kufr. To hide, to reject. In Islamic context, kafir is a person who rejects Islam. In English, it is non-Muslim. So if a non-Muslim is telling me, why are you calling me non-Muslim? So I have to call him a non-Muslim. <laughs> if you say, don't call me a non-Muslim, then I'll say, say the shahada, I will call you Muslim. So kafir means basically non-Muslim. So why are they feeling it is bad? A non-Muslim is a non-Muslim. So why should he feel bad? It's an Arabic word. If you translate non-Muslim into Arabic, it is kafir, one who rejects Islam. So if someone is feeling bad that don't call me kafir, then you should then you accept Islam, we'll call him Muslim. Hope that answers Thank the question. You.
Can we have the next question? Seven, please, if any. From any non-Muslim. Any non-Muslims who have the question, please come to any of the eight microphone. Any non-Muslim. Please feel free, you're most welcome to ask any questions. Anything on the topic, out of the topic, no problem. A non-Muslim. On any of the eight mics. A non-Muslim. A non-Muslim brother, a non-Muslim sister, have any question? You're most welcome. I was told that the university has a large percentage of non-Muslim. Not majority, but quite a substantial. Any non-Muslims? Don't feel shy. This is your opportunity. You don't have to agree with me. Only give me the reason why you don't agree. Any non-Muslim? MashaAllah, when we have programs outside, the non-Muslim questions never end. I was two years back in Kuala Lumpur. The, it was a program, longest program of my life, six and a half hours continuously. Two and a half hours lecture, four hour question and answer session. Started at 8.30, 9 o'clock, started ended at 3.30 in the morning. Six and a half hours, only non-Muslims. Only last one round we gave to Muslims. Non-Muslims did not finish. Why, Kedah is different. Any non-Muslims? Or the Muslims that are scared away the non-Muslim? <laughs> if there are no non-Muslims, then we can continue the question and session with the Muslims. Uh, please, point number seven. And after number seven will be number two. Assalamualaikum, Doctor. My name is Asri Tadi and I'm a student in international uh, business. Sorry, not very clear. My name is Asri Tadi and I'm a student in international business. I would love to ask your opinion in sex education where it is quite a little bit sensitive in our country as well for the student. So in your opinion, Doctor, if the subject had been hailed, what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional other than just teaching and also what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional as sister, a student. Sister, can you speak a bit slowly and loudly? <laughs> can you repeat the question slowly and loudly? Even the microphone, I mean the, I cannot hear your voice clearly. Okay. Can you hold the microphone close to your mic, uh, uh, to your mouth please? Okay. okay. Hello? Yes, yeah, that's better. Okay. 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 <laughs> So my question is Mashallah. about your opinion in sex education, where it is quite sensitive in our country. So in your opinion, doctor, if the subject had been healed, what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional other than just teaching? And also what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional, as a student? That's my question. Thank you, doctor. The sister has the question that if there is sex education, then what is duty as a Muslim should be allowed and duty as a student that should be undergo that sex education. Sister, if the sex education you're giving is within the purview of the Quran and Sunnah, it is perfectly fine. But if it is outside the purview of Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited. Now let me explain to you my answer. That sex education, I'm a medical doctor. Sex education is a vast terminology. While giving sex education, if you break the haya, the modesty level, and break any rule of Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited. For example, I, as a medical doctor, I would say that, okay, I will tell to the gents, don't have sexual intercourse during menstruation, sex education, no problem. But if I break the haya 
and try and show a model of a woman in front of a gent, it is not permitted. So as long as you do not break any ruling of the Quran and Sunnah and then impart the education, no problem. But if you break any rule of the Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited for a teacher to teach, it is prohibited for a student to learn. Hope that answers the question. It's a generic answer. So sex education is a vast terminology. But if you're talking about sex education of the Western country, most of it is haram. I'm a medical doctor. And it doesn't benefit, it causes more loss to the student than benefit. So as long as the education doesn't break any rules of the Quran and Sunnah, it is permitted. But what we learn in the Western education or sex education, most of it, it against the teaching of Quran and Sunnah, the way it is taught. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. And uh, we move to uh, point number uh, number two, please. Number two. I'm sorry, I think we are wasting too much of time in between the questions. If you allow me to handle, if you don't mind, please. I would like that the microphone should be reduced because we don't understand where is, never did they have eight microphones, it's too much in a small auditorium. Anyway, we'll go in a clockwise fashion so it becomes faster. Because if you're going here and there, people are confused. Mm -hmm. So, can we go in a clockwise fashion? Because you said yep. in your rules, from it's left to right. Up. So if no one is there on the microphone, we skip the microphone. <laughs> now, so number two there. Uh, so if you go in order, not one seven, one, after one comes two, after two comes three, after three comes four. So if you go from one to seven, the person microphone two is shocked. Why are you missing? I learned mathematics. After one comes two, after two comes three, after three comes four. So we go in a clockwise fashion, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We come back to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If there is someone which is not there on that microphone, we go to the next number. So everyone is aware. And the cameraman also aware where to go. Because now this program is going live. <laughs> this program is being live telecast on the Facebook and the YouTube and millions of people are watching. So if we leave a gap so long, everyone, you know, it's late in the night. So let's not waste time between the questions. If you see my program, it is one after the other. So please, can you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mm -hmm. in a clockwise fashion okay. and go fast, please. Uh, now point number two. <laughs> number two. Where is number two? Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is UNE. I'm from Thailand, actually, and I'm studying here in Islamic finance and banking. Um, I would like to express my gratitude as I'm so overwhelming having been a part of this event. However, my question to you is about the role of Muslim professional, as nowadays the uh, woman position has been considered differently from the past, like women can be the leader, women can work outside, but if lo we looking for into the Quran or our Hadith, actually we women are not allowed going with our mahram or anything else, and also there is the idea which is in, uh, gender equity. So just summarize my questions again. Your suggestion to the Muslim professional role. Thank you. If I understood the question correctly, the sister is saying that now there are Muslims also who are professional women. Is there gender equity in Islam? And can a woman do all the jobs? if I understand the question correctly. Sister, if you hear my talk on women's rights in Islam, Islam believes in equality between men and women. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the woman different than the man. Biologically, they're different. Physically, they're different. Psychologically, they're different. Each has a different role. I cannot say, you know, I'm equal to the woman they found to become a mother. I cannot. Can I become a mother? 
cannot. A woman, she's a mother. Allah has made biologically a woman. She is meant to be a better mother, a man. A woman can take care of a child better than a man. We have in the Western world women going for work and the father doing babysitting. Upside down world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Before I give this hadith, I would like to give a brief. That overall men and women are equal, they are, but they are not identical. I'd like to give an example. If suppose in an examination, there are many students appearing for the examination, two of them, they come out first. Student A, he gets 80 out of 100. Student B gets 80 out of 100. There are 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. If you analyze the answer sheet, in answer number one, student A gets 9 out of 10, student B gets 7 out of 10. So in answer number one, student A has advantage over student B. In answer number two, B gets 9 out of 10, student A gets 7 out of 10. So in answer number two, student B has advantage over A. In the remaining eight questions, both of them get 8 out of 10. If you add up, both get 80 out of 100, they're equal. But in answer to question one, student A has a degree of advantage. In answer to question two, student B has a degree of advantage. Similarly, men and women overall are equal. In some aspects, they are identical. Not in all the aspects. They're biologically different, physically different, psychologically different. So depending upon the psychological nature and the biological nature, the roles are different. Some, both can do. Majority thing both can do. Some things only women can do, man cannot do. Some things only man can do, women cannot do. So depending upon the background, it is distributed. Overall, they are equal. For example, if a robber enters my house, you know, I'll not tell my wife, women and men are equal, go and fight. I'll not tell my daughter, go and fight. Men and women are equal. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 35, that Allah, men, the men are the protectors of the women. The men are the protectors of women because Allah has given them more strength. Where it comes to motherhood, where it comes to motherhood, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, the hadith I wanted to quote to you, in Sahih Bukhari, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, our beloved prophet, there was a man who asked the prophet, who should, who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? The prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. The prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. The prophet said for the third time, your mother. The man asked after that too. Then the prophet said, your father. That means 75% of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25% goes to the father. That means mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, also the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the consolation prize. I cannot say, what is this? I want to be mother. No, you cannot be. So you have to understand men and women are equal. Now, this Western world talking about women liberalization, even they don't consider men and women equal. If men and women are equal, when they run a hundred meters race, do men and women run together? Yes or no, sister? Do they run together? When they run a hundred meters race in the Olympics, do men and women run together hundred meters? Huh? Why? If they are equal, they should run together. Why not? Because even the Western world knows men and women in physical activity are different, run differently. If you are running together, it is not correct, it's inequality. Do you understand? But when you sit for an examination in your college, do you sit together or not? Same paper? So many times it's equal. But sometimes biologically they're different. You cannot say I will have 100 meters dash together. Football is different. Men different, women different. So what you have to realize, the, woman, the Western world also believes in it, but they are giving false talk of women's liberalization. In the garb of women liberalization, they are degrading our sisters, our mothers. 
They, it is nothing, the Western talk of women liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, degradation of a soul. The Western talk of women liberalization is actually, they are selling our daughters and making it in the name of, of art and culture, they are utilizing our mothers and sisters. You know, you have ad. When you see an advertisement of a motorcycle, who rides motorcycle more, girl or the man, men or the women in the world? Who rides more? Men. Invariably in a motorcycle ad, you'll find a woman. Why? Why? To attract. Men are riding, so why do you show motor women? Why? They are utilizing our mothers and daughters and they're selling them. I was told about a very famous ad, the BMW. I was told. I have not seen it. One of the person told me a very famous BMW ad. There is a girl standing in front of the ad with bikini and the ad says, test drive her now. Who, the girl or the car? What are they doing? They're selling our daughters, they're selling our mothers and talking about women's rights. You have to be very careful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given men and women are equal in Islam, but they are not identical. Depending upon the physiological nature, biological nature, Many a times they have the same role, many a times they have different roles. Hope that answers the question, sister. Uh, brother at the back, please. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sayyid Muzaffar from Applied Psychology Department. I have a question about my profession. You are already doctor and you know very well that when we have a patient who comes to abuse, who is sitting for two people. Brother, case, I, would, I mean, case, brother, I do understand Hindi and Urdu. It will prefer that you ask in English. English is very fluent. <laughs> and most of the people understand English. So please ask the question in English. I won't have to repeat it. Okay, okay. And where are you? I cannot see you. Class, you can you raise your hand? Where are you? <laughs> okay. Where are you? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes. I'm the blue shirt. I want to ask about my profession. That some cases uh, which deals by... What's your profession? Can you repeat your name and your profession? I am Sayyid Muzaffar Hussain. Yes. From Applied Psychology Department. MashaAllah. Being a psychotherapist, we deal some cases kind of like abuse in these cases when we take case history and we goes to treatment for those patients for example uh, when goes to catharsis and in these two conditions in uh, case history and uh, catharsis the both are needed to loneliness in patient and therapist should be alone and before uh, your uh, in your lecture, you are asking that one one person in sitting with opposite sex uh, in the same room and both are alone, then third person will be saying. That's why I was asking, what is your uh, opinion about psychotherapist like in particular scenario in the catharsis and case history? when the person is opposite sex. Brother, the question that he's doing psychotherapy and many a time he has to be alone, alone uh, uh, with the patient. So I said that a prophet said that if two opposite sex now I am alone, the third person, what should he do? Point number one. Yeah. I will answer in general then come to your question also. Generally, generally, as far as medical science is concerned, if you have a medical problem, it is preferable that a lady goes to a lady doctor and a gent goes to a gent doctor, generally. Not only psychotherapy, any therapy, generally. Whether it be general medicine, whether it be heart specialty, whether it be kidney, anything. If you cannot find a specialist in that field, if you cannot find a specialist in that field, 
you may be a lady and the heart specialist ex expert is a gent. In this case, you can meet the gent doctor, but there should be a lady also in that room. And this is ethics we are taught in the medical science. In the medical science, if I'm examining a lady doctor, I mean a gent doctor is examining a lady patient, there has to be a female nurse, compulsory. Yeah, ethics of medicine. As far as consultation is concerned, talking about psychotherapy. Yet, according to a prophet, you have to have a third person should be a lady. Because a beloved prophet said that if two namerama are alone, the third person may be a Satan. Coming to your question. In Western world, there are many psychotherapists and psychologists who treat opposite patients. What happens? They do haram things afterwards. Do you know that? You're a psychotherapist. When you're sitting, asked together with an opposite sex, if you're sitting with a lady patient alone in the same room, staring at her and talking to her for hours together, if nothing happens to you, you require a psychiatrist. You're a psychotherapist, correct? You're sitting with a girl alone in a room for hours together and talking to her. If nothing happens to you, there's something wrong with you. Do you understand? So most prob mostly in the Western world, when the psychotherapists meet each other opposite sex and sit in a closed room, they even meet outside in a closed room. And do what? They break the trust of the patient and the doctor. But in Western world, everything allowed as long as it's with consent. In the Western world, you have sexual relationship, personal security, no problem, as long as they agree. Have sex with your doctor as long as they agree it's allowed. In Islam, no. If you have to have sex, you have to marry. If you want to stay alone. So, as a professional Muslim, if you are a psychotherapist, see that you keep a nurse outside with you, not in your cabin outside. When you have a female person, patient, that nurse should sit behind. This is Islam. If you cannot do that, then you change your profession. Do you understand? This is Islam. The best psychologist, there's no better psychologist than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of treating the patient, you will go on the wrong track. The patient may go on the wrong track. What if the patient lays the allegation that you are doing psychotherapy for two hours with her, and if she lays the allegation that you have misbehaved with you, what will you do? I'm asking a simple question. You're sitting two hours alone with a female, okay? And if she lays the allegation you misbehaved with her, what will you do? Oh, microphone, mic. I I cannot justify and I cannot defend in this situation. You cannot defend, so you will be behind bars, correct? Yes. So you take protection. What is your protection? Keep a female nurse. Keep a female, yes. Female nurse? She can sit behind in the same room. So it doesn't break the hadith. When you're examining a female opposite sex patient, compulsory has to be a third person. Third person so that she's comfortable. This is the ethics of medicine. And it's the ruling of Islam. You may be a doctor, whatever it is, you have to follow the rules. If you are even a teacher speaking, giving tuition, you cannot give in a closed room. It's common. You cannot give in a public area, different. In a closed room, secluded area, third person is the devil. So whatever you do, even if you meet a specialist, you have to follow the rules. The rules and regulations have to be followed. This is Islam. That's the reason you find so many things, people doing haram activities, because they fo don't follow the rules of the Creator. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. Uh, brother, in the middle, please. Next question. Brother, in the middle. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum uh, My name is Abdul Azim B. Azmi. Uh, I am uh, Deputy President of Student Representatives uh, Council. Okay, um, my question is, what is your opinion uh, when a leader does not express his support for matters organized by Islamic association, such as intellectual programs and religious program, instead only silence when the program is being pressured by someone who has the will to stop the program? Thank you, that's my so I do not understand the question clearly. Can you repeat it? I heard some part of it, but I do not understand completely. Okay, uh, I will uh, read slowly it. and clearly. Slowly, okay. Uh, my question is: 
What is your opinion when a leader does not express his support for matters organized by Islamic association such as intellectual programs and religious program instead only silence when the program is being pressured by someone who have the will to stop the program thank you the question you understand correctly what should a leader who doesn't support islamic program yes. but there's pressure from outside to stop it yes this is because uh, there's uh, in the organization there is non muslim so the leader take that action to take care of the non muslim heart ah now i understand <laughs> that if an islamic organization wants to do an islamic program the leader is silent because some non muslim the if the son the non muslim the objecting so what should be done if the objecting point number 1 i know you are relating to me i am aware of it <laughs> that many people objected to this program point number 1 the leader should check whether the objection is correct or no if the islamic organization is calling a speaker which is abusing other religions and which is criticizing other religion and causing communal disharmony that program should not be held but when someone lays the allegation quran says kul hatu buranakum produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you are truthful correct i know that many many a time when i go in this country the indian non muslims they object 100 times more than the indian non muslim in my country i don't know why when anyone objects what should the leader do the leader should not be scared that he lose the election the leader should be for justice allah says in the quran in surah an-nisa chapter number 4 verse number 135 ya ayyuhal ladina amanu oh you believe stand not for justice that witness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it be against yourself even if it be against your parents against your relatives rich or whether they rich or poor he should say just this so if someone is laying allegation and saying okay dr zakir naik is causing community ceremony okay get me proof show me one lecture show me one lecture of dr zakir naik where is causing community ceremony simple you know i have given more than 2000 lectures it was said by the coordinator if you have at least in 1% of my 1% of my lecture will be 20 lectures correct forget 1% 0.2% at least four lectures so anyone who laying a objection first question you ask him how many lectures have you heard of dr zakir naik completely first question if they show you a clip out of context out of context you know quran quran says do not pray quran says do not pray do you agree with me or not no what no i'm right who says no raise your hand Quran says don't pray. I am right, mashallah. So what do you do not pray? Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 43, do not pray when you are intoxicated. So when you read the context, it is saying do not pray when you are having alcohol intoxicated. But if I quote half it will give a wrong message so anyone who says dr zakir naik is speaking against other religion you said give the proof get me one one lecture full lecture out of the 2000 i have given full lecture not clipping of 2 minutes out of context only one not even two zakir naik promotes terrorism get one lecture one lecture only full lecture read will hear the full lecture where he promotes terrorism cannot the world was calling me on counter terrorism the head of the counter terrorism department in uk in 2009 approached me saying you can reach those muslims who we cannot reach can you help us i said under two conditions as long as you do not ask me to do anything quran and sunna against the quran and sunna and i don't want your money they agreed next year the government changed labor party lost conservative came now they want to call me a terrorist ajeeb indian government calling me to give lecture in national academy the biggest training center in india for the police i have given lecture there many times new government is saying i am terrorist ajeeb what happened to the world 
I ask anyone who speaks against me, at least get me one proof, not two, one proof. Not out of context. It is so easy. The media here speaks against me. I ask the journalist, how many lectures have you seen of mine? Not even a single. You don't see a single lecture of mine and telling Zakir is, is spreading hatred. Is it justified? The leader should not get scared. And if actually the Muslim die, he's spreading hatred, he should not be called. But don't go out of context. You know, the Malaysian paper say Dr. Zakir Naik is banned in many countries. Do you know I'm not banned in a single country? Only once I was banned in UK. From 2010, and the letter says for three years. Officially, I was banned only in one country for three years, from 2010 June till May 2013. That's it. There is not a single country in the world that I know of which has banned me. But yet the press says, yes, that's a different question that half the country won't give me visa. If a country doesn't give me visa, doesn't mean I'm banned in the country. Indian press says, I'm banned in Malaysia. <laughs> Ajib. This is the job of the press to lay allegations. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, check it up before you pass it on to the third person. Verify it. You don't have to believe it. Unfortunately, what nonsense the media writes? Get proof. That's the reason when Indian government, you know, there is not a single court in the world, anywhere in the world, including India, which has passed a verdict against me. I want to repeat, there is not a single court anywhere in the world, not even anywhere in India, which has passed a verdict against me. Yes, complaints, thousands. There are thousands of complaints against me, FIR filed against me, not a single verdict against me. Even the case which the government has filed against me for money laundering, last year in January 2018, it was a Sikh judge. Justice Manmohan, I don't know him. I have not met him. First time I heard about him. Fortunately, he had seen my videos. He's telling the investigation lawyer, have you seen the lectures of Dr. Zakir Naik? He said, no. He said, I have seen. Get me one lecture where he speaks for terrorism. I will ban him. I will, I will see to all his properties are confiscated. They could not. Again, last month in March, Again, they want, to cost me, they want to confiscate my property, money laundering. The same judge says, get me one proof, not two. So the verdicts have come for me, yet the press says, money laundering, money laundering. What they do, they pick up an article from India. If the article is negative, it will start by saying, a controversial speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. When you read the first sentence, you understand it's a negative article. I was with one very famous Muslim news agency here, media, I won't take the name, and the owner was my fan. He took my interview. I said, bye, why do you copy verbatim? You're copying from other people without checking. Why do you copy? At least change the starting line. Who's not controversial? Every famous person in the world is controversial. There's not a single famous person in the world who has no controversy. Can you point out one? One famous person in the world who's not controversial. Can you point out? So if they want to write a favorable article, they will say world-renowned speaker. If they want to write against a controversial speaker. The problem is anyone lays the allegation, get proof. And that's the reason when the Indian government wanted to put me on the Interpol. If any government writes to the Interpol that he's a terrorist, 99.9% .9 they'll put him on the list. In my case, they did not. Why? Today, if you tell a Muslim is a terrorist to the Interpol, 99% they will put him on the list. In my case, the Interpol rejected. The Interpol rejected India. Why? Fabricated. Indian government has asked so many countries give up Zakir. Not a single Muslim country gave me up. Why? Why? Because they know it's a fabrication. I know there are some Muslim countries that will give up. All Muslim countries are not truthful. All Muslim countries don't believe in the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa, chapter 135. We say the stand not for justice. I really appreciate Tun Mahathir. Tun Dr. Mahathir, he's one of the few politicians who will fight for the rights of the Muslim, even if it goes against himself.
appreciate him. As far as the Muslim rights are concerned, even though having a government, which many of the MPs are non-Muslim, he is very just. What we have to appreciate, he was the first person in the world who filed in the tribunal of Kuala Lumpur, war tribunal. And he did a case against George Bush and Tony Blair, first time. And said, if these president of America and the past president of UK, if they have to step in Malaysia, we will arrest them. MashaAllah, who had the guts? So Dr. Mathe, that time he was in the prime minister also, Allah brought him back. I don't know about the other politics, but I know for sure that what is haq, what is truth, you have to fight. He's one of the few Muslim politicians who have the guts. All Muslim politicians don't have the guts. They will give the decision based on their benefit. Okay, if I, if I go against this Muslim, I'll get more votes, okay. Even the, even the Muslim is correct, no, put him into problems. What we have to realize, but the media, the biggest problem is the media with fake news. Fake news. I challenge any of the news, any of the news media in any country in the world, whether it be India, whether it be USA, whether UK, whether Malaysia, who writes article against me, how many lectures have they seen of mine? Even if they have seen any one lecture, can they point out that lecture and show it on the television? I will pay the money. That is against humanity. I challenge. They are doing a propaganda. So here, if someone is laying an allegation, the leader should ask for proof. Okay, Dr. Zakir next spoke again. Get the full lecture. We will see it in an auditorium. Show it. And anyone who has little knowledge of Islam, he will be able to prove that this lecture is not causing communal disharmony. Because Quran clearly states in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that if that abuse not those people who they worship besides Allah, the God who they worship bes besides Allah, lest in the ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. Uh, can we allow a brother uh, with the mic at, at this side, please? Hello, hello, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Shashi Barman. I'm a non-Muslim, I'm a Hindu. So uh, I only have three questions. So, <laughs> so, so, can you speak a bit slowly into the mic? If you have three questions, ask your best question. Okay. Whichever is most important. After we finish all the questions on the other microphone, we'll come back to you. Okay. Then slowly, I'll... clearly, loudly, microphone very close to your mouth. Okay. Cool. Okay. So my first question would be: I, I, I'd like to relate it to you. So I've seen your previous speeches before on YouTube. You are a specialist in comparative religion. So when you like. Uh, compare Islam and other religion like Hinduism, like quoting scriptures from Bhagavad Gita or something, like don't you think there is a possibility to misinterpret it and provide misguidance to those who doesn't belong to that faith? What's your name, brother? Pardon? Your name? Shashi Varman. Okay. And Shashi. if if there are, it is proven that there is a misinterpretation in your speech, does that mean that you failed to carry out your duty as a Muslim professional? The brother asked a very good question, yes. a very relevant question to the topic. I'd like to thank him. His question is that I'm a specialist of comparative religion. I prefer calling myself a student of comparative religion. And when I quote scriptures of others, other religion, like whether it be the uh, Bhagavad Gita, whether Veda, whether Bible, and if I misinterpret that scripture, then isn't it wrong as a Muslim? Totally wrong. I agree with you. That's the reason after every lecture of mine, we have question answer session. Most of the religious speaker, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Christian, whether it be Muslim, most of the majority, more than 90%, after the speech, they have no question answer session. Sheikh Didat was the first one who started, and now, mashallah, many of us, after every question, after every lecture, we have a question answer session. Why? So that if you disagree with us, you are open to ask the question. In the question answer time, if any speaker, including myself, if the questioner proves that my interpretation is wrong, I, if, I, if they prove to me first, I will say, I am sorry, I will take it back. If I make a mistake, as a Muslim, compulsory, I would apologize. I would first say, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your scripture, 
Inshallah, in future, I will not quote it. Never in my life of 25 years of dawah, more than one, has a single question of mashallah. I can make mistakes. I'm a human being. I'm not perfect. No human being is perfect. Not a single question ever quoted me anything and proved me wrong. Alhamdulillah. I can be wrong. I can be wrong. Therefore, we say, ask the question. If he poses a question to me, I will counter quote him and give him the quotation from his scholars. I will quote. What does Swami Vivekananda say? I will quote. So we did the intellectual. That is the reason what we say, let's come for a debate. Friendly debate, no problem. But I'll only debate with someone who has some standing, not with every Tom, Dick and Harry. You understand? You know, if I can get a million people for my talk largest gathering, even if we get 2%, 20,000, I will debate you. Any Tom, Dick and Harry, I cannot. So what my reason is, if you want to debate me, you should at least be able to gather minimum 20,000 for your speech. If I can get 2 million, you at least get 2%. Okay? If you can get 20,000 for your lecture, I'm willing to debate with you. If you cannot get, you give it to someone who can get. And there are many Hindu speakers in the world. There are many Christian speakers in the world who get 100,000 and more. In India, many people. You know Shishi Ravi Shankar. He gets audience of 100,000. I debated with him. And you know the outcome of that. Have you seen the debate? Yeah. What was the outcome? It was. It what? It was an as I expected. Yeah. Sorry? It was an as I expected. Yeah. Oh, you, it wasn't as you expected. Yeah. But did I break any rules of the debate? Pardon? Did I break any rules of the debate? No. Did I not answer all his questions? No. Did he answer my questions? No. No. One of the most famous Hindu preachers in the world, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. Many people call him God. Uh, but, but, sir, uh, how about Sadhguru? I guess he destroyed some of your points, I guess. Sadhguru from the okay. Foundation. Okay, arrange for a dialogue, I will debate him. You arrange, I will debate him. Sadhguru is a famous person, ask him. I will debate him. There are some people who have taken his speeches and given answers, some people not himself. If he wants, let him arrange. No problem, I will debate him. Okay, because I know he's famous. Any famous personality, if he wants to debate, I don't want to debate him. He wants to debate me? Open. Any topic. Any topic on comparative religion. Hinduism and Islam, no problem. Okay? I'm welcome. And if he points out anything in, in my speech, which I said, which is out of context, or which is not as per the Hindu scripture, I'll apologize. I will give him from where I got. All my research are not from non-Hindu scholars, from Hindu scholars. I give the reference. So most of the speakers say, yes, Zakir is right, but... Then the but comes. Many Hindus say, when you hear your speech in two hours, I've learned what I've not learned in 40 years of my life. Because in my speech, I give references. Did Shishi Ravi Shankar give any reference in his speech? Even one reference he gave. Did he give a single reference, brother? In my speech, how many references were there? So who is more authentic, a person who gives a reference or a person who doesn't give a reference? He could have kept a chit. There's no objection. In a debate, you can have notes in front of you, right or wrong? I don't have notes. He can have notes. Ask if Shishi Ravi Shankar will have a second debate with me. Will he have? Even if you give him a million dollars, he will not have. I guess he will. But if he doesn't debate you, I'm sure one day I will. Yeah. Most welcome. The day you can get 20,000 people for your audience, I will debate you. Now what you can do, question answer. Did I answer your question or not? Yeah, you did. Thank you. Very satisfactory? Yes. I'm very happy. Thank you for accepting it. And may Allah guide you. And I'll pray for you that you come to the truth, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, most welcome. Uh, please, next question. Hi, hi, sir. Uh, I, I am a, a non-Muslim, and I, my name is Alita Hahao. 
I want to ask the daughters a few questions. The, the, the first is how the, uh, how we call the, the, the Islamic will affect to the, in the Lysa and the sector of the economy, the medical and the... Sorry, brother, I cannot understand. Can you speak a bit slowly and loudly? Yeah, yeah. And your mouth close to the microphone? Okay. Slowly and clearly. Okay. Yes, brother. Uh, first, my question that I want to ask is about the, the Islamic will give any effect for the stuff like the education, medical, and the economy in the few years that will come. Sorry, brother. I, Islamic medical economy, I do not understand. Uh, the Islamic e effect in the economy. Like the Islamic fire, like, effect in the economy. economy. Yes. Which economy? And the, uh, the second one is about the. Brother, the first question: effect of Islam in economy. Yes. You want to know what is the impact yeah. and effect of Islam uh, in economy? First question. Yes. Uh, the second one is about the the law of the hudud. Second one is law of the hudud. He has two questions. First, the impact of Islam and economy. The Islamic economic. I've given a lecture. Interest-free economy. In Islam, we believe in economy, it should benefit, but Islam is against riba, as I mentioned in my talk. According to Imam Dhabi, it is the twelfth major sin. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278-279, if you do not give up demands of riba, of interest, Allah will wage a war against you. So in Islamic economy, you should not deal with interest. Anything dealing with interest is prohibited. You cannot take a loan from the bank on interest. You can take loan from a bank on an Islamic Sharia concept. Call as Musharika, call as Mudariba, call as Maraba. There are various aspects. But interest, it is haram. So if you have this economy which is not based on riba, it will be a more stronger economy. We know a few years back in 2008, there was a collapse of economy, right or wrong? The city bank went down, everything went down. Right or wrong? Because of, of riba, because of interest. So Islam is against interest. For more details, you can refer to my video cassette, Interest Free Economy Promulgated by the Glorious Quran. As far as your second question is concerned, what are my views on hudud law? Hudud law means if you do a crime which is a very severe crime, then you require a severe punishment. So based on that, most of the countries, they have the rules and regulation. And depending upon the crime you do, they put that law. Islamic law is the best example. It is as our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if certain things are big crime, if you implement the hudud, the results are the best in the world. That is the reason the least number of crime in any country in the world is in Saudi Arabia. Because that law is applied. The moment you dilute the law, even in Saudi Arabia, you'll find crime coming. So as far as the laws are concerned, if you follow the law of Allah and his Rasul, it is the best and the best result you'll get. Hope that answers the question. Uh, doctor, Thank you. I, I still want to ask about the hudu. If you say that uh, I still want to ask the hudu. Like we see at the, at the African country, more than half the African country is like more for the Muslim country. But they still use the hudu. By the, the number of the criminal uh, case still increase. In the brother, that's a good question. He says half the Africa is Muslim. I don't know whether half, it is less than half. But why are there so many criminals and crime? The reason is because they're not following the Islamic Sharia. Show me one country in the world which is following Islamic hudud and the crime is high. They are namesake Muslims. They are namesake Muslim, but they are not following the Islamic law. One good example is Saudi Arabia. You have the Islamic hudud, the least rate of theft anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. The least rate of rape anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. Why? Why? Because they are following the law. Any country you implement the law, you will get the best result. These countries are namesake Muslim countries. They are not applying all the laws of Sharia. If you apply all the laws of Sharia, whichever law you apply, in that country you will find success. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, our brother there. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good evening. Uh, I would like to ask you, sir, uh, about 
Uh, there are so many different countries that are applying the different law in the country. So according to the law of Islam, uh, about the criminal, we apply the hudud. However, in certain country, we don't apply hudud. How do I practice if I am a judge or a lawyer? How do I practice the duty of a Muslim as a professional? In what's the name, brother? Farhad. Farhad. Yes. Uh, so, how do you practice? So how do I practice the duty of a Muslim if I state the judgment? Uh, not based on the Al Quran and Sunnah, but I based on the law of the country. Ah, if you are practicing as a Muslim professional lawyer, and if the law of the country is going against the law of Islam, you don't practice that law profession. Simple. Yes. Uh, if so the law of the country is going against the law of the Sharia, you don't practice it. It is haram to practice. Yes, it may be very close to it, no problem. If it is contradicting with the law of the Sharia, you cannot practice it. Okay. Simple. So I give you example like... Uh, Whether you asked a question, I give the answer. Now you want to give example after I give the answer. Yeah. Uh, Can no. we have the next question? No, no, it's not next question. It's my, my not yours. There are many people waiting on okay, different okay. microphones. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, most welcome. Can we have the next question, please? Uh, next questions from in the middle. Hello. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good Waalaikum morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to Dr. Zakir Naik. Um, I straight to the point. Uh, my name is Muhammad Farid Muhammad Azmi. Uh, I'm from BBA student, second, second year of BBA student. The question is, the era that we're living in now has developed into a world that has no boundaries. We have no limited access... Brother, brother, slowly, okay. clearly. Okay. <laughs> the because question... the problem is the microphone, it's not very clear. All right. You can hear your voice, but here the microphones are not very clear. I mean, the speakers are not clear. So therefore, if you speak slowly, it will be more... Sure. Understandable. Yes, brother. Thank you. Jazakallah. The era that we're living in now has developed into a world that has no boundaries. We have no limited access to all information worldwide. However, with all these technologies, the Islamic country is still unable to help those in need and to stop the oppression of Muslims in Palestine, Gaza, Syria, and etc. So, I want you to share your thoughts on this matter. The brother has asked a very important question that today the world has become into a global village and we can get information, you know, at the tip of your fingers, WhatsApp, YouTube, Facebook, various things. And today we find that many Muslim countries are under oppression, whether it be Palestine, whether different countries, Syria, Yemen. So what should we do? Brother, go back to Quran and Sunnah. The problem is that we Muslims, as I told my lecture today, have a lot of money, wealth, Instead of spending in the right way, in the cause of Allah, they are giving it to the enemies because they are afraid. They think that the enemies of Islam can save them. If they spend it in the right way, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we Muslims are united, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamia wa la Hold strongly together to the rope of Allah and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, we are about 2 billion Muslims. More than 25% of the world population today are Muslim. 25%. We are the religion which is the maximum practiced. In numbers, the Christian may be more. In practice, Muslims are the more. If we are united on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, we will be the biggest force. No one will be, a, no one will be able to persecute us. The problem is, if one country, Muslim country is in problem, the other Muslim country say, why should I interfere? Our beloved Prophet said, if one Muslim has a problem, like how one body has a problem, the other body also feels the pain. So we should be united. As I told, there are very few Muslim leaders in the world today who voice out their opinion for the Islamic cause. You have one Erdogan, that's in Turkey. May Allah reward him. You have one Thun Dr. Mahathir here in Malaysia. Hardly you can count on your fingertips. There are so many Muslim countries. But where? They don't want to open their mouth. They are afraid. Why are they afraid that if I interfere, Maybe they will subjugate us. Maybe they'll have economic blockade. They don't have faith in Allah. 
Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 135, Ya illadhin amunu, O you believe, stand out for justice that witness to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, against the rich or poor. The problem is that we are afraid more of the enemies of Allah than Allah itself. If we go back to Quran and Sunnah, if we are only afraid of Allah and no one else, we'll again be the strongest force in the world. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they say? Let me pray that may Allah ease the difficulty. Every individual, whatever you can do, at least you do. Whether you can do dua, minimum do dua. You can support economically, support economically. What do you can do? If Allah has given you the power to speak, then you speak. Just a couple of weeks back, there was a conference in Putrajaya for Masjid Aqsa, in support of Masjid Aqsa. And mashallah, speakers came from all over the world. They invited me also to speak, and I gave a speech. The problem is that we Muslims today are afraid. Allah has given us the wealth, but the Prophet said, I'm more fearful, I'm not fearful, afraid of my ummah about poverty. I'm more afraid that when they become wealthy, they will go away from the deen. This is the problem. So if you go back to the Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sayyidin, and if you're united, we'll be the strongest force in the world, and no one will be able to subjugate us. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Thank you. Uh, brother, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Waziri. I'm from Nigeria. I'm a PhD student here. So it's a golden opportunity having an interactive session with you. My question is uh, louder, please, brother. During the Rabiul Awal, where millions of Muslims all over the world we are celebrating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I come across one of your writers on Facebook that those that are performing Maulud is Bidya. So I just want to, you to enlighten me more. Why do you think those that celebrated the birth of our noble prophet, even right point, now here? Point number one, this question is not on the topic, but it will answer you. This question is out of the topic. Okay. It will answer you because it's talking about me. Okay, Point number one, the Facebook you're talking about, which gave an article a few months back, that is a fake Facebook on me. The, my Facebook has got 17.4 million likes, followers. How many? How many, brother? Brother, can you hear me? Can you come to the microphone? Yeah, yeah, I heard you, yeah. Did that Facebook we spoke about me had 17.4 million likes and followers? No. There are more than 100 fake accounts on my name on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. If you know a little bit about social media, any Facebook which has original will have a tick. And that Facebook was picked up by the Malaysian media. Oh, Dr. Zakir Naik says, agrees with the fatwa of the Saudi Mufti. That Facebook may not be his in the ending they're saying. They are picking up a fake Facebook. That today what you have in the social media, there are thousands of posts made by others on me. Thousands. Many are made by my fans, many are made by my enemies. One third of them, I actually think what I said in my lecture, they make it and they upload it, no problem. Some things my fans make which I did not say, but it's correct as per the Quran and Sunnah, again I have no problem. One third are enemies of Islam who want to malign me. Once one poster, Dr. Zakir Naik says, having sex with the sheep is good. No, where they get this from? They take my photograph from the Facebook, correct? So first, as a Muslim, what you should do? Quran says in Surah Ujura, chapter 49, verse number six. When you get the information, check it up before us conveying, brother, did you check up whether the Facebook was authentic or not? Tell me frankly, you're a Muslim, correct? Yeah. Did you check? Yeah. Did you see that article yourself on the Facebook? Yes or no? No. No. Correct. You read an article in the newspaper and you believe the kuffar, correct? <laughs> this is the problem. If a kafir is saying Dr. Zakir Naik is wrong, you are believing more in the kafir. What you should have done? Gone on my Facebook, it is there. 
This is the problem. We Muslims don't follow Quran. What does the Quran say? Check it up before asking any question. Did you check up? How long does it take to just type Facebook Zakir Naik? 10 seconds, correct? But no time, okay. busy. <laughs> Who's to blame? <laughs> this is how the kafirs are dividing the Muslims. This is how the non-Muslim media, they know the weak point of the Muslim is there are Muslim sects with different views. So they purposely let these different views come and divide us. Correct? What the Quran says? Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103. Hold together to the rope of Allah strong. Even if we differ, why should we fight? Even if you and I differ on certain things, does it make us to fight? What are you doing? You're helping the enemies of Islam. Correct? You could have gone in your room and checked it. Five minutes. You want to ask the question in front of the public, okay. And be an agent of the enemies of Islam. Brother, will you get sawab for this? Brother, will you get sawab for this? Uh. <laughs> yes or no? No. <laughs> I forgive you. Thank you, sir. Because I love you, brother. Thank you so much. I, love I, you I said this, why, brother? Not to be angry against you, to show you an example. And I thank you for bringing this question, though it's out of the topic. People should not say, oh, Zakir is running away. So if it's a personal question, answer. Because I'm a da'i of Allah. I'm on the haq. Why should I be afraid? There may be difference. You may say, keep your hand on the chest, someone sit down. So what difference does it make? Yes, you follow what is right, but we should not fight over it. Correct? Yeah. If someone keeps the hand on the chest, someone keeps down. Difference of opinion. I do my research, I follow, I may differ. But that doesn't make us Muslim. You know, I've given a lecture. I'd given in Tirango, I'd given in Tirangano in 2016, unity in the Muslim Ummah. If we differ on small issues, we believe in the same Quran, we believe in the same Prophet. If we differ on small issues, we should agree to disagree. We should agree, and disagree. agree to disagree, but on the 95% we are same. So why are you helping the Kuffar, the enemies of Islam to make the Muslim fight? This is the job of the media. And the media, especially the non-Malay media, which I read, majority of the information is wrong. Majority. What they write about me is wrong. No one is taking action. No one. No one. Shame. No one is going and telling the media, where do we get this proof? They are picking up some information, another media, and they are laying allegation, laying allegation, laying allegation, and they are making Muslim fight. They know there are differences. This is what we Muslims, we all the Muslims should be united. We may differ, no problem. We agree to disagree. Don't let the enemies of Islam get better of us. I'm not trying to get any communal disharmony. I'm trying to get the Muslims united. And you know the best rights that any Muslim has, that any non-Muslim has, is under Muslim rule. You see the history. This is the history of the world. The amount of crusaders, the amount of torture they did in the name of religion. Even the Christianity sect was tired. And the amount of non-Muslim, they enjoyed security in the rule of the Muslim land. I'm talking about the great Muslim rulers. The Muslim, in Muslim rule, the maximum protection any non-Muslim can get anywhere in the world is in the true Islamic rule, not the fake one. No, today most of the Muslim countries are namesake Muslim countries. But those who follow Quran and Sunnah, the best you will find is in the, raw, in, is in the law of Allah and His Rasul. We cannot do injustice even to a non-Muslim. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there are still uh, some more questions uh, to be asked. But unfortunately, we just uh, get the notification that the last bus provided uh, will only be uh, and will be ready uh, within a couple of minutes. So I will only allow uh, one last question from our sister, please. Hello, hello, hello. Can I ask a question over here, um, left website? Hello. <laughs> oh, there. 
Okay, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay uh, hello, my name is Libiana Eggy. Uh, I'm taking risk management and insurance. So my question is, uh, before that, in my religious education, the birth of Jesus is there and the death of the God of Jesus is there. In Bible, there is no death that says the birth and death of Jesus. So my question is, is it in Islam believe Jesus in the Bible has his death of birth? And if I'm not mistaken, it is in January month. So I just want to explain from you, doctor, why in my religion is not mentioned in the Bible of the birth, death of Jesus, and what evidence in the Bible is the Jesus death of birth in January? Thank you. Please, sir. <clears throat> Sister, your question wasn't really clear. I understood about that the Bible speaks about the birth and death of Jesus Christ, about the Quran. Can you, sister, speak a bit more slowly and clearly? It's not your fault, it's the fault of the sound system. So I wouldn't blame you. Can you repeat the question slowly and clearly so that I can give a better answer? Part I understood, but not completely. Okay. Um, straightforward. Uh, to my question, is it in Islam believe Jesus in the Bible has his death of birth? And if I'm not mistaken, is it in January month? Is it in Jeremiah? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, just Jeremiah. what I heard from someone. So that the birth and death of Jesus is in the Quran. Uh, no, in Bible. Okay. The question I understand that the Bible speaks about the death and birth of Jesus. What do the Muslims think about Jesus, peace be upon him, about the death and the birth? As far as the birth, I will compare both the birth in the Quran and the Bible and I'll compare the death in the Quran and the Bible. Uh, yes. Yes? Uh, uh, I just want Dr. explain. Uh, why my religion is not mentioned in the Bible of the birth death of Jesus, but um, from Muslim, they believe that uh, in the Bible, there is the death of the birth of Jesus. <laughs> death of the birth of the Jesus. Uh, uh, oh, dead. Ah, uh, dead. The, oh, date of the birth of Jesus. Yeah. Ah, now I understand. The sorry. Death, the birth I was saying and death, death. death of the birth of Jesus. So <laughs> date. Okay, sorry. It's my fault. It's not your fault. And the sound system. <laughs> now I understand the question. And correct me if I'm wrong. The sister is asking, why do the Muslim don't believe in the date of the birth of Jesus Christ? Peace be upon. Correct. I am a student of comparative religion. I don't know anywhere in the Bible which gives the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Uh, Will I continue? Yes, continue. The date, you give me the reference, I'll accept it. I've read the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, what does the Bible say when Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, when she shook? The tree, the date fell. No, dates are not there when it is winter. So from this incident you come to know that surely Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, wasn't born in the winter. What we come to know when we study Christianity, it was in the Council of Nice in 325 CE. They used 25th December as the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, because Actually, 25th of December, in paganism, they believe it is the birthday of the sun god. And in the paganism, they wanted to match something with the people new so that more people are attracted towards Christianity. So it was by a few Christians who suggested there is no evidence whatsoever in the Quran or any Christian scripture about the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. This is taken from paganism and they adopted it 
and they gave it 25th of December, there is no proof at all. If there is proof, you give it to me and I'll accept it. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, thank you. Much welcome. Thank you very much. And with that last question, then we come to the end. Uh, to the end of uh, this session. So Jazakallah Khar al Jaza, thank you very much to Dr. Zakir Knight with all the knowledge that he shared. And I believe that we have obtained a lot uh, from him today. Thanks again and a big round of applause to Dr. Zakir Knight. Uh, with that, I. Uh, uh, apologies for any shortcomings while I'm handling this session. And until we meet again in any further, uh, any future opportunity, then I will pass this mic uh, to the MC. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you to our speaker and moderator. Moving on, we would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Hendrik Ben Lamsali, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Students Affairs and Alumni, accompanied by the Program Director, Mr. Mohammad Imran, to be on the stage to present token of appreciation to Dr. Zakir Nai. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Amin Rashid bin Yatiban, our program moderator. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Hendrik Melamsali, Mr. Mohammad Imran, and to our speaker and moderator. Announcing the departure of Associate Professor Dr. Henry Lamsani, Dr. Zakir Nai, and other honorable guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain calm.